let's, let's talk about what is interaction, uh, human-computer human -computer interaction. So here's the official title slides, and if you notice, they're all in this lovely HitLab font. Um, actually, uh, I'm just a visitor here, so a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, I'm at the Department of Computer Science at UCL. I've been doing virtual reality for um, 25 years. Um, uh, and we've done a lot of different things in sort of virtual reality, uh, such as uh, how, what is it, the people's reaction, the presence, immersion, telepresence, and so on. So you'll hear more about that later on in the module. Um, I'm actually on sabbatical this year, so I've been at Microsoft Research for six months, um, pre just prior to coming here, uh, working on mix mixed reality systems, and the systems that are beyond HoloLens 2, so I know nothing about HoloLens 2. I really don't know anything about it um, because it's a product and once something becomes a product inside a company like this, it becomes completely secret because um, you, know, you don't want anything to leak about spe specifications and so on. Um, but we'll all know in about three weeks or so, no, in a, in a, less, no, a couple of weeks at least, um, that what, what's in HoloLens 2. Uh, so, and that'll be a state-of-the-art augmented reality system. Um, so I'm here, uh, for six months, so I won't see the end of your projects, but um, I can obviously I'll be around and you can ask me all sorts of things about VR and while I'm here. Right, so uh, let's start off with, let's start off with the grand scheme of things. Um, interaction, what it, when we talk about interaction, we talk about all sorts of, we talk about essentially the whole of engineering and science. So we're gonna start narrowing it down uh, quite rapidly. Um, in the most general sense, interaction couples two systems together. Okay, so it couples two systems by transfer of energy or information. Okay, that's about as general as you can get. It's sort of like physics. Um, uh, so physics is full of sort of interfaces between things. Um, and all machines have an interface. Um, some of them are fixed function, no humans in the loop, like, like the windows here. There is a human in the loop, but they sort of, they're way off and they're building service, they're called a building service engineer. Okay, so they program this system for the amount of light in and out of the system. But then it has sensors, and if it gets really hot, or then it'll, the windows will open and I sit over there and it's constantly opening and shutting um, during the day, depending on the, wind, the sun direction. So you see uh, some of these systems are human in the loop and real time, and that's mostly what we're interested in, is that there are two systems, one of them is a human. Um, and uh, obviously some systems are very general purpose, the human has a lot of input to the system, can do all sorts of different things, like with your smartphone. That is a massive system, it's very interactive. Um, it's got a human in the loop, but it can do all sorts of different things. But here's an example of something which is very specialized, right? So, uh, and the reason for showing, um, yeah. Yes, yes. That's because I plugged it into a television that supports uh, digital rights protection, okay? Um, so, so here's, uh, it's an aeroplane, right? So it's three axis control aeroplane. Um, and you'll notice that there's, a, there's two controls, con input control systems here. Um, there's uh, the yoke and the, and the pedals. Um, so um, the pedals turn this red thing, they're all connected together, and the green thing is connected to, the blue handle is connected to two surfaces, um, the uh, aerolons and the flaps. And the combination of these uh, three degrees of input gives you three degrees of control over the aeroplane. Okay? Um, so the reason for showing this is, of course, that this is a human-computer inter interface, right? It's got a human in it. All planes are the same, right? So uh, I, I went on Rob's mountain bike at the weekend. Uh, Rob's mountain bike is set up as an American mountain bike with the front brake on the, the wrong side. I forgot which way around it is, right? So. <laughs> it's the wrong side for an Englishman <laughs> on a mountain bike. Okay, so this is serious if you're going downhill fast on a mountain bike. You brake with the rear brake first. If you brake with the front brake first, you will entertain some rotational... Uh, 
you do it once, yeah. Then you swap the gear, le the brake levers. Out. But on an aeroplane, this is this is always the same, right? There is no variation at all in this, okay, around the world. Um, the implementation can be very different. So the reason for showing you this is because there's a famous example, lots of famous examples in human computer interaction about we replace these wires, these cables, and in most planes they are physical cables, right? So um, and physical rods, we replace that with wires and control signals. Okay, so we, we, we replaced it with, um, with, some, uh, with some switches, some joysticks and so on, but it still does that, right? It's still, that's the mapping and nobody gets to customize it, right? You don't get to sit down and say, oh, I know, I'd like, I'd like it to be, I'd like it to be the way around, okay, um, with this. You just learn it this way. Unlike, say, a first-person shooter game where you just, you know, you pick up the controls and you customize them, right? Because it's not so much at stake uh, when you leave it in one state. So, um, so there's some famous examples in human computer interaction of people taking systems like this and improving them and getting it massively wrong, right? So you can, there's a wonderful case study of, uh, of um, things that went wrong in aeroplanes that have uh, electronic controls in them. If you're interested in this area, any interest in avionics at all, or interested generally in HCI, this might be one thing you come across. There's a, there's a crash of an Airbus, which is totally related to the fact that the control, the, the pilots were looking at the control, thinking it said one thing, and that was actually the other, it was actually, they thought they were looking at what's called a ground level meter. It's got a proper name, I forgot what it's called, an altitude. It tells you which way the plane is sent. If you're flying an aeroplane um, and you're in a steep turn, it's actually quite difficult to tell which way's up. Um, uh, because of, the, because of the, the forces in your backside is pointing up in the direction you're turning. Um, and so you have this uh, a pose. It tells you where the ground is, the roll. And the, it's going one, one of two modes. One is how much pitch you have, and the other one is where the ground is. And they literally got it wrong. They thought it was doing the other. So they went into a bank, 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 kept on banking until the plane stalled. And then they, they've, they've made some other mistakes, right? So... <clears throat> Um, but that was, that was the, the issue, is that the, the, an electronic control wasn't doing exactly the same as they were. As, and planes are fascinating because they, they, they have to do the same thing um, so, uh, so that you know if all the electronics goes off, you can still fly the plane based on what you learned in your very first training aircraft. Have you ever tried yeah. in New Zealand? Yeah. So, so I'm do, I'm doing that right now. Uh, I have turned. I've, I, I'm doing that right now in the car because it's. Uh, yeah, I, I'm adapted to American cars at the moment. I just bought one over here. Okay. So these conventions are everywhere. Pedals. The accelerator is always on the on the right. Can you imagine what would happen if you switched them over? Of course, early on in car design, they had ongoing fights about which way around the pedals should be, but then everybody decided it should be, we should decide on one and then not have it. Parking brakes, every, all bets are off, right? So I'm getting used to a foot brake. I've never had a foot brake, and uh, the car I just bought from, which is Japanese, imported from, uh, foot brakes aren't a thing except in trucks in the UK. So I've never driven one except in a minibus slash truck. Um, no, nobody's got one in their home car. And my, my previous car had an electronic brake so it literally had a switch and you pressed it and it turned the handbrake on. Me and my partner didn't trust that thing at all, right? Because, uh, you know, you press a little button like this and it's... Sort of, uh, anyway. anyway, so you see, that, right, there's conventions. So we conventions emerge. There are no conventions. Well, what were the conventions on this thing, right? The conventions are roughly that we all see icons when we turn them on. If you turn on my phone or I turn on yours, we won't know what on earth is going on, right? We, we might recognise some icons. We might. These just changed in the last two weeks, right? They just changed all these icons down here on my phone. I actually had to learn which ones were which. I, I, well, I could guess, but I had to look and I had to understand again which ones were which. So bear in mind that a human interaction can be in various different states at different times. So what is it? Now, uh, so here's a bit of a, so a, bit of, a um, sort of obvious point. Human computer interaction depends on the computer and, and next there's gonna be a human, right? So, uh, Computer, so computers and systems uh, emerged and from the need to solve a particular task. Um, you can go and visit this one if you come and visit my lab and you're interested. We can take a day trip to here. It's in a place called Bletchley Park. 
Colossus is the computer partly designed by Alan Turing to break uh, Enigma codes in the Second World War. And it's, it's a human-computer interaction. It's one of the first stored program, uh, it, well, it's arguably stored program. There, there are long arguments about this. You can go to whole conferences about this, so at which point my interest wanes a little bit. Um, but it's got paper tape um, that stores the, uh, the settings for the, for the program, and it's got this plug board which sets other settings for the program. So the interface is thousands of switches and this paper tape. Um, paper tape was not novel at that stage. You might think it's really old technology, but it comes from the 19th century, right? So you know, jacquard, um, jacquard looms, uh, so a 19th century invention could use paper tape to set the patterns for weaving of cloth. So actually storing things on tape has been around for a long time. Uh, and we can go and see this. I don't think they have this one running, but they have the successors to that, called, which is called the bomb, um, was running. Okay, so here we've got a very, very specialised computer. It does exactly one thing, and it has to do it in a fixed amount of time. Um, so design constraints on this were it must do it as soon as possible um, because the codes change every 12 hours or were changing every 12 hours um, at the time. So there's, and there are lots of different codes. It's a fascinating story if you want to watch the film and then go read the book about the, uh, the Enigma uh, system. And it, uh, so it depends on the computer, and then it, British examples here, it depends on the user. And the reason for putting that up is putting uh, um, Stephen Hawking up, a couple of reasons. One is that almost all user interface design is assuming that somebody's able-bodied and um, has ac access with their thumb to the whole screen in case with this one, right? So um, it, that you can roughly reach everything by moving it around with your thumb, and you can do that. Um, whereas Stephen Hawking um, has, uh, again, is an interesting case study in human-computer interaction. Here, you don't have a particular task you want to do. You have a particular intellect that you want to make available to the world. Right? So he's, uh, um, you know, you, it's just him. There's one interface for him. And this is a stage, um, this is just when he's about to go on the, he went on the Vomit Comet. Uh, the NASA shuttle, which does the, the um, parabolic curve, so you're weightless. So this is him just before that. He's actually, as you see, his flight patch just on the side. His interface is very heavily customized. He has control over the muscle in his right cheek. And if he does this, he can stop a cursor moving on the screen. And that's how he writes his physics papers. Um, right? uh, and that's gone through a couple of iterations. He used to be able to move his mouth, and they used to have a, a sensor on his mouth, um, which, can, which could, uh, he could actuate. Um, so that's the first reason, is that most interfaces are very general, very, very general. Sometimes they're very specific and you have a very particular thing you want somebody to be able to do. Or, you know, and that could be one user. Uh, the second reason for that is this is all open source. So you can actually download his interface and, and, and hack on it. He's obviously died now, but, um, um, but it's open source and was a, Intel made this a case study of how to make an interface with very noisy information. Because uh, you can imagine that the problem is not that he can, he can click a button on the screen, essentially, that's it. A cursor moves across the top of the screen, he can make it stop. But what happens when he gets it wrong? Right? He, needs a, he needs an undo button, and he doesn't have one. Um, so they make a system where it's trained for him and his vocabulary and what he's writing on at the time. And actually, this is not a, really a system for one user, because he has a permanent member of staff, um, a sort of postdoc who works with him, to sort, of, sort of help him. So when he's, when he's writing a physics paper, he doesn't go into LaTeX and start typing. Right? He tries to explain it to a very, very, very knowledgeable postdoc who could write the paper and just says, shall I write this whole paragraph? And he goes, yes or no, essentially. And then, um, so he, obviously he doesn't type a lot, um, but he's able to communicate through the computer and another person. Okay, so, here's, so that's, that's the scope, right? You've got very specialized machines, very specialized users, and you've got everything in between. Now, a quick point about engineering versus research, and uh, it's a shame Rob's out of the room because we can have a debate about this. Uh, there's a famous computer scientist called F uh, Frederick Brooks who has written a couple of seminal books in the field. Uh, if you're a computer scientist, you'll have come across one he wrote called The Mythical Man Month, um, which is very old, and um, uh, even the title belies how old it is, right? So. Uh, so it's written in the 60s, and um, um, the basic premise of that book was that you can't, you can't get any faster 
uh, software by putting more people on it. But the same is true for sort of any, any sort of design work. The way to solve a design problem is, not, is to plan properly. It's not to throw more people at the problem. But he has another paper called The Computer Scientist Toolsmith, and I really love this. I'm not sure if it's him or it's something the copy editor has just stuck in the paper over the top. Um, uh, but it, it says that the scientist builds in order to study and the engineer studies in order to build. So we're going to do, a, there's an important point here, we're going to do a lot of building and studying. Um, but you're going to do more studying because the first thing you need to know is what is the vast, the vast possibilities of interaction design because you can build pretty much anything, right? So you've got to decide what you're interested in and then what skills you need. Um, so engineers study a lot in order to get the domain knowledge um, so you, of, of a field. You need to look at a lot of apps. You want to think about apps, you need to look at a lot of apps. You want to build games afterwards. You need to play a lot of games, right? The first thing, um, I've sat in a lot of games, I've worked at Electronic Arts for a few months, and we interviewed some people for some graduate entry jobs. And the first thing they get asked is, tell me about your favorite game. Okay? What is your favorite game? And they go, what, what do you like about it? And, um, and why don't you, and say, say they pick Medal of Honor, they go, okay, why don't you, why don't you play Call of Duty, right? Or some other game, right? Why don't you play, why do you play that one, not this one? And that question is going to lead to an hour debate about what it is that actually is the design question there. Okay, so we were interviewing for a team at EA which was making a game which is very different from those, um, which it never came out because the game got cancelled while I was working on it. Um, but it, it, the design was very different. It was very, um, very clean. There was no score. There was no little markers on people and so on. So they wanted to know, they didn't want you to buy into the design. They wanted you to know what the design parameters possibly were. So there's a lot of studying, right? There's a lot of looking at things, looking at the capabilities. Now, Rob and I, and the reason is now I'm going to go back to the first one because we're in the room, we build things in order to study the outskirts of human-computer interaction. And the, the basic question here is, if I build this, will it work? Um, not, I, and we often don't have a, a user in mind. We have a sort of vague capability in mind, or we've got this idea about something that works. Now, unfortunately, for, for the study, you have to read a lot of these things that were written by people that didn't have users in mind. So you need to get sensitive to that um, because we're researchers. Um, and I'm going to tell you a lot about the practical things I've done. I already told you one about the AR app. That's possibly more valuable to you than the research I did in AR and VR. Okay? It's the things we actually built that went away and did, had users attached. Okay, so to emphasize that a little bit more, HCI engineering is a practical discipline. It's about learning about users and computers. In, appropriate, in order to build appropriate interfaces given a specification of a need. That's going back to that diagram. You've got to know what to do. Uh, you, the domain knowledge is good design, rules of thumb, typical requirements, capabilities of systems. And the tools and techniques are design techniques, evaluation, over to some other, formative evaluation and summative evaluation, and development. So it's a bit of building the thing, right? So going away and testing ideas with people. Some of that testing you can do with paper, some you can do with cardboard or video, others you'll need an actual app in the hand. And then HCI research is more about what HCI can and should be about, what can be built, the properties and capabilities of systems, how to design. So a lot of the techniques that we're going to look at are just appropriated from other domains. Okay, so uh, brainstorming, is just something that designers do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, unlike last year, I'm going to show you mood boards, which is a very product design thing. I'm going to show you some mood boards. And you're going to get you to design one, and everybody's going to go, "What on earth is one of these for?" And it's just, it's a visual de reference design. You, you know, if you're going to do game design afterwards, somebody's going to say, to, somebody's going to say to you, "I want it to look like um, a Kami." Everybody played a Kami? famous PlayStation 2 game. You're a wolf. It's done in a Japanese pen and ink style, right? So there's some domain knowledge for you. But then you're going to need to go and think about, I want it to look like a Japanese pen and ink drawing. And um, the graphics engineer is going to go, you want what? 
<laughs> no, uh, I, need another, I need another developer um, uh, because it's going to be hard. Uh, uh, but the designers are going to go, okay, what, what does that look like? How does it need to, how's it going to need to move? Um, and so on. And they'll, they will, to some extent, will plagiarize Akami, that game. Um, it's not called Akami, is it? What's it called? Something like Akami. <clears throat> um, and then what to design, critiques, desirable features. And I'm, and I'm, I'm interested in this as a HDI researcher in VR especially, but I've done some interesting, what I think is interesting work in what should we build, what is the scope of HCI, and so on. Okay, so then finally, for this part, then we'll switch into some sort of review material. Um, HCI engineering research involves a lot of different people. So, um, uh, so I have a stack of PhD applications to my group on the table at the moment for when I get back. They include an architect, um, a film artist, um, a bunch of psychologists. Um, we even have some computer scientists. Um, and they all want to come and work on VR, um, which is a HCI. So there's, uh, you've got a whole plethora of things there, a whole set of domain, domains. And to some extent, you have to pick the ones you're interested in and get comfortable talking to them. So I've had work, day long workshops with people that do theatre direction trying to tell them what VR can and can't do, okay? And they're, they're telling me about how they train actors, opera actors, to, to show emotions when they're on a stage and they're, they're, there's a thousand people watching them, okay? So it's fascinating for me. I learned a lot about opera. I went to see some operas, uh, which I wouldn't normally do. Um, and they're telling me what their, what their skill is, what their craft is, not, not how to make a great opera, but what it is day to day they teach actors in opera to do, and I'm going, it'd be great if our avatars did that. Okay, so can we make, an, well, can we make a, a character for a game that looks like it's more authentic than, the, uh, than um, a normal player? Can we give it some stereotypical behaviors? Um, and those, are just, uh, th those have come from opera. That, so we, we haven't actually run that experiment. I would love to do it, but we didn't get time in the end. The one thing I did learn, I'm sorry this is an anecdote, is uh, opera singers are la hey, loud and you can't motion capture them. So I thought, oh, well, I know, we'll do a motion capture of somebody doing opera. Uh, okay, so this, you know, you've got a tenor in a room, you'll need a bigger room, right? If a tenor sings in a room like this, you'll be deafened, right? Because obviously they're supposed to fill a whole auditorium, they're not amplified in a big auditorium. Uh, but what did I learn? I learned that they vibrate. They sit, they're so loud, even the soprano was singing, when, when he and she were singing, they were, they, they were sort of, their, their, their chests and their muscles were vibrating. It just threw our motion capture system off. You know, we simply couldn't track them, uh, things on the chest. We wanted to get some the idea that somebody was really singing um, because we'd done some motion capture of a singer and we'd done the moving around and it looked like they were acting. Um, so we really wanted a singer to look like they were really singing and we couldn't do it. So that's an interesting challenge of the limits of what I can actually, I can generate as content in a, in a motion capture system at the moment. Okay, anyways, that's an aside. Okay, so that's, that's HCI in a nutshell. Okay, that's the, that's the thing we're gonna learn about. We're gonna look at a lot of different things. So, we'll switch now to a little bit of history. So, um, and there's a point coming in a couple of slides, uh, which I think is very, again, very, very yes, valuable. In your so, office. You, as an um, intellectual worker, were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that, that was that alive for you all day and was instantly responsible. Uh, it's coming out responsive. of oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> instantly responsive to every action you had. How much value could you derive from that? Well, this basically characterizes what we've been pursuing for many years in what we call the Augmented Human Intellect Research Center at Stanford Research Institute. We're going to try our best to show you rather than tell you about this program. Unfortunately, I can't filter, filter out the uh, piano accompaniment. Uh, this, but this is, okay. this, this demo is 90 hand, minutes long, so this is a cut-down version we'll of it. The screen that he's um, working, and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. It's called a mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Yeah, Sometimes never I seen apologize. one. It yeah. started that way, and we never changed it. This characterizes the way I could sit here and look at a completely blank piece of paper. That's the way I start many projects. So with my system, that's a good start. I'll sit here and say, I'd like to load that in. 
So I'm putting in an entity called a statement, and it's full of other entities called words. And if I make some mistakes, I can back up a little bit. So I have a, a statement with some entities words, and I can do some operations on these. I can copy a word, say that word like copy after itself. Let's make more statements. I'll say copy that statement, and all people will have another word. Copy that one, another one. I can even copy groups of statements. I can say after that one, copy the group from there to there. And it does. So let me jump back to the head of this. And I can do things like begin to reorganize it a little bit. Well, I say after bananas, it's more likely that I'll uh, take the carrots there. So let me organize it by saying, uh, just generate produce. All right, produce, I've got carrots. And I'll move under there also bananas. In fact, I could move a whole group under there, saying oranges and apples also. Well, I'm going to do something called jump on a link. And a link is something that will go between files. So what it's going to do, it says I'm going to go to your file name, CNRO. So here's what I do with a picture drawing capability. It's a slight map if I start from work. And here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that, and oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. <laughs> Over, so on his display, he sees my text, so I'll execute it. And sure enough, it does. But what's that? Running around. Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting there in Menlo Park looking at this text, and he can point to it. But we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this, so my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. So we've set up now audio coupling, and then we're both looking at the same display, and that'd be very handy to work. We can talk to each other and point, and maybe later I can hand you the chalk on this blackboard, like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. Come in, Menlo Park. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected. Audio, you can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. Okay. And a forthcoming That's enough of that. Okay. involvement is this art. Right. <clears throat> so as Rob said, 1968, okay, um, what's the first year you used Google Docs to actually collaborate on a document? Five years ago? All right, so there, there have been systems that do that type of thing ever since 1968, okay? They've just not been available to people. And this demonstration and other demonstrations around the time um, are 50 years ago, right? So 50 years ago, real-time video conferencing while you were editing an app. Now, you can construct that yourself, right? You can get Hangouts and Google Docs up. You can do that now. Um, but at, the, uh, at that time, you obviously, you needed, uh, you needed a network to do that, and, and the ARPANET was only just, I think at the time, he goes on to say there were 20 machines on the ARPANET um, at the time, uh, one of which was actually at UCL. There you go. It's the only one outside the US uh, uh, was the first one. At UCL, and again, small anecdote: um, they, to get it to get ARPANET into the UK, they had to declare the basement of a building I used to work in American territory. So when it got called American territory, it got Marines guarding it. So uh, so they actually um, and it we don't live in that building anymore. But um, if you've got if you go around at a museum and you see that early diagram, if anybody's seen an early diagram of an ARPANET, there's a sort of spider diagram. The last picture they ever drew of all the machines on the internet. Um, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, it's, uh, it's UCL. Okay, so there's lots of features there, and, and it's not to prove that this thing is old and therefore you shouldn't know all these things. The point coming is that what's going to be in future interfaces is available out there somewhere now already. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's skip over that. I'll, I'll skip over this one. Um, uh, there, there's this idea, um, and I, at Microsoft there's Bill Buxton. Bill Buxton is one of the great and good of HCI, been around forever, has published more papers than, than I will probably ever read. Uh, that's not true, but he's published hundreds of papers, he's a nice guy. 
And he has this concept called the long nose of innovation, which is the bulk of innovation is low amplitude, takes place over a lower period of time. Companies should focus on refining existing technologies as much on creation. Uh, and he gives a nice anecdote, which is that everybody, everybody uh, lots of Xbox owners got a connect. Um, with their, so a depth camera, they could wave at the computer, do their hand gestures and so on. Okay, when do you think that came out? Right, so you could buy it five years ago. Five years ago, roughly, Rob? Connect. Uh, it's Xbox, it's Xbox 3. It's seven and seven, let's say less than 10 years ago. When do you think that technology first became available? A camera that could read depth. Any guesses? Raw guesses will do, right? But first of all, everybody knows what the connect is. Yeah. It's not a, again, razor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time yeah. To talk about these things. We make yeah. some assumptions when we're yeah. filming. So the connect is a camera that takes pictures, takes video, and. Four years ago? Four years ago, yeah. yeah. So the technology, of course, comes from. you. Uh, so. So Rob's quite leading me to point out that if you look at a, a connect image, should we look at a connect image? Um, it's a t type of user interface where instead of you get a, you get a picture, but you also get depth. Okay, so let's just play some video. Let's see if that's any good. So you stand in front of it. Uh, um, oh. All right, you stand in front of it, and in tell telling you that this is the picture you get off it, and this is how far away everything is. Okay, so it's uh, red things are furthest away, the blue things are closest, and you can see that as he moves, you can see a silhouette of a human. So you can use that as a human-computer interaction. Um, easily you can wave your hand around, and, and uh, you can see that. You yeah, can you know, how far away yeah. each pixel is, not just the color of the picture. Yeah. Okay, so that's what a Kinect does, but the first Kinect that uh, was actually came with a, with a silicon graphics demo, the first camera like this is a sort of product you could buy, Obviously, in the lab, it probably 40 years ago. It was 1991 as the first time you could actually get one of these as a human computer interaction researcher. Left, uh, Sorry? Probably the video. Ah, right, <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, right. Okay, so, um, and then William Gibson always has something good to say about this type of thing, which is the future is already here, so it's not very evenly distributed. Uh, so, one of the things to learn about, read about, is that there are all these capabilities in devices. Some of them are in, uh, there are lots of technologies out there which you need to integrate into your system. So to go back again, um, it's the one I skipped over um, in this. Uh, same year. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay, it's better, you look at it online. So the TV has done something odd to this. Sword of Damocles, Ivan Sutherland, uh, uh, 1968, head-mounted display. Uh, this is augmented reality. And uh, did you go to SIGGRAPH? No. When? Uh, no. no. Okay, so they just had a celebration, 50 years of this demo, um, last November, uh, last dis November in Van uh, last July in Vancouver at the big conference in the field, which is called SIGGRAPH. So it's, all, so it's got all the features you might expect. It's got see-through, wireframe graphics, so you can overlay things. Um, it's, uh, it's got mechanical ultrasonic tracking, egocentric six degrees of freedom of viewing. It's head-mounted, and it's 50 years ago. Okay, so, and I said I've been doing this for 25 years. There are people in the field that have obviously been doing it for even longer. And, um, yeah, you, you don't get many more... The, you, Interesting later on in the course for you to go back and think about that demo and see what's different on a HoloLens. Okay, they got some things very right with that demo. It's egocentric, so uh, as you move around, uh, the graphics change, so you can walk around objects on the floor. The graphics are terrible, right? There's, I think they could do a handful of lines, but it's, it's still, the, the, the idea is there. 
And Ivan Sutherland is, a, again, another one of the great people in the field um, who has a lot of seminal uh, contributions to, compute, to human computer interaction and computer graphics. Okay, so, uh, right. Okay, so a brief history. Let's talk a little bit, and then um, I thought I'd make this slightly interactive, or, well, we'd make this more interactive by asking you some questions as we went. So, we started off with Colossus, machines built for very specific purposes, and hey, human interaction has gone in waves since then. So it's gone in a series of um, sort of stances towards human computer interaction or things that it's concerned with. Uh, so for decades after the Second World War, this was the type of interaction you have with the computer. It's a keyboard. Mice come from 1968. It's not the very first mouse, by the way, in that demo. It's not, they have existed for a few years before, um, before um, um, that, the mother, that, that Engelbert, that SRI, sorry, that Menlo Park demo. Um, but uh, what, interesting, what was more common was actually light pens. So drawing on the screen with a light pen, which sort of went away and then comes back occasionally with your smartphones or, or one here, right? So pen interaction is, comes and goes, okay, how, how useful it is uh, or how, how it's implemented. So you've got an interface like this. You have a keyboard, you have a screen, and you're a HCI designer, okay? So you're looking at this going, I'm going to make a new one of these. What's your main concern with this? What, what sort of questions might you ask about this? What sort of things will you fiddle with? Colour. Colour. All right. So there's the. Uh, so I'm going to call colour, and I'm going to call it the form. Input, the keyboard. The keyboard. Right. Efficiency. Yeah. Efficiency. Uh, if you want another aside, go and read up why we use QWERTY keyboards. Why are the keys laid out like this? Okay, it's it's stupid. Okay, it's stupid reason. Okay, okay. It's something to do with typewriters and yeah, the way the keys good. interact with each other. So it's actually to slow you down. All right, this layout. So it's efficiency. Um, so the keys. Um, there's the form, the colour, the size of the screen, resolution, and things like that. So there's, there's the sort of things, and this gets a little bit into that, 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 that big demo we saw, is a sort of operations on it. The resolution, the, the types of thing you can do on the screen. So at this time, people, computers are sold to people, to applications where the person is going to be trained and they're going to use this a lot, right? And, and if you want a, a really good example, the, the, there are the remnants of these systems from the 60s and 70s in airport ticket booking. If you, if you really go and if you actually look at what a travel agent is doing, um, they've got the Windows front end, they drag and drop things on one end, and then they'll switch it to another mode, and you'll see something not at all unlike this, where they have to press a key, it's got different modes depending on the key they press, and it's all about making them fast and error free because this, this system is to save somebody money. Okay? It's about efficiency, about operation, and so on. So of course, uh, and you didn't have very many of these. So one of the nice things about being in Seattle is there's a place in Seattle called uh, the, the Living Computer Museum, and they run these machines. They, they've got them all working, and well, they've got a dozen of these machines working, and you can log in, you can type on them, and, and uh, obviously most people play games on them, because of it. As long as there's been teletypes, there's been games. Okay, uh, ridiculously expensive games to run. Okay, so next phase is essentially that's becoming a commodity, right? So millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, down to thousands of dollars, and then there's a there's a home computer boom. And I haven't got too many of these pictures, but <clears throat> here. Um, We've got, some, we've got many of the same issues. We still want it to be form, we've got efficiency, operation. But now there's a, there's, a, what's the, there's a critical step here, is it's going to somebody's home. Accessibility. Yeah, it's accessibility is a new, new thing. 
Okay, so more people have to use it. It's got to be learnable, right? You know, learning and self-tutoring are issues, right? So somebody's got to look at this and figure out how to use it. So you didn't buy a computer, right? Now we just go and buy smartphones, right? We go and buy one and that's it. We get an iPad. Uh, you, you didn't bought a computer. You bought a computer and some books to go with it, okay, that would tell you how to use it or things to type in. We've also got s software. So we've got software that you can load onto this, which is then a design issue. So at this stage, you get, a, you get an explosion of software, right? People like me in my bedroom programming pieces of code to sell to people that, you know, I'm, you know, you make a little bit of money out of it. Anybody can make a little bit of money writing software. It was a one-person activity, and you know, I know people that went on to found companies that, that then made millions of pounds writing software. So there's a big split, and that's important because what comes next is standards. So it was the chaos, it's the wild west. You write a piece of software for a machine, then this thing comes along and we've been living it with it ever since, right? The IBM standard PC architecture, okay? And if you go and talk, we had discussions inside Microsoft about how this is really standing in the way of cloud service. Does everyone know what a cloud is? Okay, everybody, everybody want a cloud, cloud computing? I like, I like the, I like the uh, metaphor for this one. Cloud computing is just somebody else's computer. Okay, so you're not doing it on your computer, you're doing it on somebody else's. It's in the cloud, it's not in the, in, the, in, the, in your, your well, and that's, this architecture is holding that back because of the way it assumes that you've got one person, one machine. Okay, so uh, again, if you're a computer scientist or want to think about the future of these systems, if you're gonna implement them in the cloud, um, you need to know what, architecture is, how data centers actually work. Um, and then uh, you start getting the things from that demo come in. So 1968, you've got graphical user interfaces. There was a little bit of that in the, in the demonstration, drawing with a cursor and so on. Came from the 60s, you start to get it on the home computers. It cost a few hundred dollars. And obviously then you start getting into things like this. Now what's a new feature here? When a certain Steve Jobs comes in, What's the new concern for human computer interaction? It has to be usable, still has to be efficient, you still have to sell them. Um, but he's famous for a few things, for, for at least, so the design, right. So the design of the thing, right. So there's the look, the feel, and the, the design as industrial design. He's famous for that, right? Um, um, and it, the, if you've seen the film, what's the film called? Uh, the recent one. There's been a film of his life recently, sorry. sorry. Anyway, there's a film of his life, and this, this isn't the important one. I mean, he designed computers that failed spectacularly, right? Um, uh, but they made a, uh, the next cube and then in this film, there's a discussion about the fact that it's 13 by 13 inches by 13 and a quarter inches. Because when you put a block on, a st on the table, it's going to look slightly shorter. And he wants it to look like a cube. Okay? And therefore, it's not actually a cube. Because it's, that's a design feature. He's also a complete font geek. This is the one thing that he was known about in, in, in university. He took a course on programming, and he took one on... on letter, design of letters. So that's what caused this thing to take off immensely is that he, he, he was selling it to people that cared about what fonts you drew things in. And, that, and you know, people on, on Windows didn't care about that at all, right? They just cared about the text, ASCII. They didn't care about what it looked like. And that launched... And what's uh, on the screen will yeah. look exactly like... Yeah, the yeah. And it, you hear this phrase from this age called WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. And we just assume that now. We don't get it most of the time, but we assume it, right? So we assume it's going to look like um, uh, on the output. Okay, so that's, that's we, this is an important point. We get to design, because a lot of it now is about design, okay? So what it looks like. And obviously, I'm going to show you a picture of an iPhone in a second. All right, um, but we can't do justice to HCI with talking about, human, about games. Um, Rob and I will have a competition. Which is the first one of these that you owned, Rob? Uh, 
Yeah, I didn't. I, I knew I, I, exactly the same. I knew people that owned these. They were too expensive, right? I, I had friends that owned these as well, lots of them. Um, and uh, anybody want to hazard a guess why I've got eight pictures here? Right, I'm going to ask you. Right, there. Eight pictures, yeah. Yeah. So, so the games industry goes in a, in a generational cycle. And these are just called generations one through eight for no real reason that, than people like to categorize things. Okay? They're, they're, they're some of the same companies. This has got built-in games. This had a cartridge. Is it eight bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, 64 bit? And then um, people think you can sell another one here. So this is the uh, Xbox One. Um, and uh, this is still the best selling one of all time. 140 million of those sold. Okay, so that's a big, big piece of HCI. So what's the, what's the big thing which is now in HCI? How do you sell these? All right, we'll jump ahead. Fun. Right, I'm gonna put that in a new column, right? Fun, right, you don't sell these things unless you can keep people entertained for billions of hours, right? Billions of hours being spent playing these things. Probably hundreds of millions of hours spent playing these things, right? They're fun, they're distracting. There's an enormous amount of done there on what it is that's fun. That's it's a science now. That's sort of games companies employ people that sort of do sort of engineering on these, these things. Um, but one thing I also want to point out is that this thing hasn't really changed either. Right, so it's a joystick with a uh, with left, right, up, down, and a button. It's just got more joysticks and more buttons these days, and a connect you can wave at. Okay, so if we get time, I'll do some physical engineering with these. They're very, very interesting industrial design considerations for these things. They have to be indestructible, and actually, a lot of it is to do with you want this control input, but you don't want if you drop it or stand on it, you want it to carry on working. Okay, so. Lots more issues there. It hasn't changed. This is basically the same as this, is the same as that, is the same as that. And you notice it's only back here that you lose a joystick. Right? So there's four generations where twin joysticks has basically been the interface. Um, we can argue for hours about where the buttons should be right? and which order they should be in. Right? That, um, that's, a, that's a sort of unholy battle that goes on in science, in a, uh, sort of game engineering. Okay, right, uh, two, more sli two more slides on this and then um, more, more fun. Um, anybody ever seen one of these? Yeah, okay, as old guys. I thought it was old. Right, it's, uh, it's Apple's last personal digital assistant. Okay, it's an Apple Newton. Don't go on Apple's website and try and find that. You won't find it. They, they sort of disowned it. Okay, but it's handwriting recognition. There's a very, very short list of these. Again, Wikipedia is your friend when you're done this thing. Uh, Handheld person, mobile computers, I haven't shown you any laptops, but the idea you can move it around and take data on the fly raises a whole bunch of new issues in HCI. Um, handwriting, and then of course, these things have only been out 12 years. We just naturally assume everybody's got one now, but they have only been available for 12 years. Um, and the design, now is now a huge thing. You sell things on the design of that, right? They change it slowly. They put a notch in the top and get ridiculed, right? And that's a design feature. There's a reason for the notch, right? A, it's a physical engineering thing. Um, so next year, you all know you're going to get a phone with a hole, right? So they're going to get a screen, all screen with a little hole in it. For the Sorry? The for the yeah, for the camera. The camera on the front, because um, uh, at the moment there's a, there's a notch because you've got to get all the devices in there, all, all the sensors in there. But now it's design, and I put one more thing on here, and we can argue about this at another day. Fashion, okay? And um, uh, tribes, I'll put this, it's a sort of sociology concept. You, don't, you sell iPhones to people who already own an iPhone, okay? It's got to look like an iPhone, okay? It's like car design. It's, it's, it's the same problem they have, and I've sat in design meetings with Jaguar Land Rover, and they said uh, we're, they have a cave, they have a very high-end VR system, and the first thing they do is, does it sit like a Land Rover? 
So they don't care about the outside because people who buy Land Rovers buy more Land Rovers and Range Rovers, right? They, that's their target market, is people who already own one. And when they sit in it, all the controls have got to be in the same place. And that's a problem because they, the technology changes and safety regulations change. So there, they wanted to feel like a, a car. And here, they wanted to feel like an iPhone. Okay, so it's got a... And if you, you get these people that have a Samsung... A Samsung I, people in Microsoft still love their Microsoft phones. Right? They adopted them and have used them forever. And then, you know, I've got... Yeah, let's skip that. We'll come back to that later on because we're running out of time. Right, so uh, the future. So I want to show you one more video and then uh, this is about what the problem is now. Um, so thinking ahead, if you want to be, be a speculate, then I'll show you one and I think Rob will laugh at this one. It's quite a well-known video and this will be, be it for today, I think. Um, this is a video called Hyper... <laughs> Concept video. Uh, goodbye, uh, and it's about great. 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 Estoy presente ahora. Me amo. Estoy libre de mi ira. Estoy libre de mi privacy and ethics. Bueno. So most of the debates around this video should be, yes, we can build that. That can be built. Not wrong, but we know the bits. We can prototype that here. We can do that. One of the projects is tracking people in uh, And then the question is, should we? Ay, no, cállate. Actually, should we build that? Um, because uh, then you're advertising absolutely everywhere in your life. And this, this film ends. It's quite an interesting narrative. Um, there's a piece about identity. Um, so the and then uh, she loses puntos, the, puntos. the whole state of the world. Nice and go back. What is this? What is this? What is Join Catholicism. There you go. Uh, so the idea is that uh, so, uh, it's a similar thing. Then like the uh, next to it, you get these issues that in, uh, about appropriation. And here's a, a very current one. Ownership. Uh, so do you own the things on your phone? Do you own the software that you have? Do you own the interfaces? Um, and how do you change them? So that, that, that's a nice ending to that, which is, it just resets, the whole thing resets, and, and it actually then becomes apparent that that whole massive confusion was by selecting in a whole bunch of services and advert services and so on. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's it for today, I think. Um, any final questions? Uh, the key thing is to go and read a lot of this stuff, right? To go and start reading about it. And um, the homework, as I said, was go and read the first two chapters of Donald Norman's book and bring me some examples for next time. Okay. All right.